Great. Well, thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Robert Hayes. I'm the Community Outreach Librarian and Head of Technical Services for the Tewksbury Public Library. I'm just going to say a few brief words and then I'm going to get out of here. Uh, first, I want to thank the 30 libraries who are partnering with Tewksbury tonight uh, for this event. Um, Belmont, Beverly, Boxford, Brewster, Canton, Danvers, Dover, Dracut, East Longmeadow, Fitchburg, Gardner, Groton, Harvard, Lowell, Linfield, Mansfield, Milford, Natick, Needham, North Reading, Norwood, Salisbury, Shootsbury, South Hadley, Stoneham, Swansea, Waltham, Wareham, and Whitman. So we thank all of them for partnering with us tonight. A couple of logistical things. Uh, we're in Zoom webinar mode, so we cannot see or hear the audience. If you have a question for Larry or for Eileen, uh, please type that into the Q&A box. We'll address all comments and questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, we'll start doing that around 6.45 or so. I anticipate the program lasting for approximately an hour. Uh, look for an email from me later tonight with a link to this recording, also a link to a feedback survey. Please take 30 seconds and fill that out. Let us know what you thought of tonight's event and uh, what you'd like to see for future events. Um, all right, so why don't we get right into it. Um, tonight, uh, Larry Tai is with us to discuss uh, his most recent book, Demagogue, the Life and Long Shadow of Senator Joe McCarthy. It's the definitive biography of the most dangerous demagogue in American history. Based on exclusive access to his papers and recently unsealed transcripts of his closed door congressional hearings. Uh, so first, let me tell you a little bit about Eileen, and then I'm going to tell you a little bit about Larry. So Eileen uh, McNamara, who is uh, Larry's conversation partner tonight, Eileen spent nearly 30 years as a journalist at the Boston Globe, where she won a Pulitzer Prize for commentary and was among the first to raise the alarm of clergy sexual abuse. She is now the director of journalism at Brandeis University. Uh, she is the author of Eunice, Breakdown, and The Parting Glass. And uh, tonight's uh, main event is uh, Larry Ty. He's the best-selling author of Bobby Kennedy and Satchel, as well as Superman, The Father of Spin, and Rising from the Rails. Uh, he was also the co-author of Shock with Kitty Dukakis. Uh, previously an award-winning reporter and national writer at the Boston Globe and a Neiman Fellow at Harvard University, Larry now runs the Boston-based Health Coverage Fellowship and he lives here in Massachusetts. Uh, so all uh, nearly 100 of us, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Larry and Eileen for joining us here tonight. And, and Eileen and Larry, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. This is great. Hi, Larry. Good to see you. Hi, Eileen. Uh, this is wonderful. It's great. All those names coming back to me from Massachusetts of all those wonderful cities and towns. 321, as I recall, cities and towns in Massachusetts. Uh, but we're not talking about Massachusetts tonight. We're going to be talking about Wisconsin, although it does have some overlap uh, with some of our more famous residents historically here in uh, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Uh, Larry, remind our audience, for those who may have like a not as great a grasp on history as they, as they would like, who Joe McCarthy was, because we know um, most of us that he was uh, elected to the Senate in 1946, the same year our friend Jack Kennedy was elected uh, to the House of Representatives from Massachusetts. But he was a pretty undistinguished Senator at the beginning of his career. But man, when he came on the scene in a big way, he did so explosively. So remind us how and when that happened. So I will, but before I do that, in the interest of transparency, I have to say, I am coming to you from 35 degree Katuit, Massachusetts, and Eileen is coming to you from 70 or maybe 100 degree uh, Isle of Palm, South Carolina. Um, so if she seems in better spirits tonight than I am, it's because I'm a little bit shivering here. But the speaking of shivering, uh, Joe McCarthy, and Joe McCarthy was um, in the period that Eileen was talking about, um, his first term in the U.S. Senate, he was on his way to becoming a guaranteed one-term senator, in and out, undistinguished, everything he tried bombed, until that night 
on Abraham Lincoln's birthday at a famous Lincoln's birthday dinner in Wheeling, West Virginia in 1950, where he goes to the dinner with a, an enormous briefcase. And in the briefcase, he's got two speeches. He realizes this dinner is his last shot at raising a big issue that's going to catch on. One speech he had in that briefcase was a snoozer of a speech on national housing policy. And had he picked that speech out of his briefcase that night, the idea that 70 years later we would be talking about him is just a non-starter. There's no way we would have ever paid attention to him and there's no way he would have won re-election. But instead he dug a little bit deeper into his briefcase and he pulled out a speech. And in his hand and in this speech, he said, I have in my hand a list of scores of communists at the US State Department and elsewhere throughout our government. And they are people that President Truman did know about, that he did nothing about, and I'm gonna help root out these people. Now, what he actually had in his hand that night might have been his wife's grocery list. It might have been a bunch of recycled names and probably was from some committee uh, that like the House on american Activities Committee that had come before him and actually knew at least a little bit about what they were talking about. But what he didn't have in his hand that night was the list of 57 communists that he said were deep in the US government. But it didn't matter. It didn't matter because it was a slow news day. It didn't matter because the one reporter from the Wheeling, West Virginia paper who was there that day realized they had a big story, a US Senator, no matter how undistinguished he might've been, charging that our government was infested with communists. And within two days, Joe McCarthy was front page news, not just across the American continent, but all across the world. And he never looked back. And he stayed on those front pages for four long years. And it wasn't inconsequential, despite the fact that there was nothing in his hand. Uh, these unsubstantiated charges sent 200 people to jail, cost 10,000 people in the United States government their jobs. Uh, he had an enormous effect. And I guess, given the way you've just described this moment in Wheeling, West Virginia, I have to ask about the press's culpability here. Did no one fact check what was on those lists he was allegedly uh, wielding in these speeches? And if not, why not? I would say two things about that. The short answer, and if I ever knew how to give a short answer, would be no. People didn't fact check that original speech until it was too late or the charges that he was putting out there every couple days for the four years you were describing. They didn't do it partly because McCarthy was brilliant at manipulating the press. He would have his press releases go out at exactly the moment when he knew reporters had only hours, if not minutes left before their deadline. And he knew what would happen was, and what did happen was, that his charges would go in with almost no refutation in the next morning's paper. And by the time they got to the people whose names were being named as being communists, by the time those reporters reached those people, they would not make it in until the following day's story. And one day's story, Joe McCarthy's charges, would be in the center or the top of page one of the newspaper the next day's response from whoever he was attacking would be next to the corset ads on page 57 of the newspaper. And I went through on old clippings, one newspaper after another, and saw that that was a pattern, that for understandable reasons, because of McCarthy's manipulation of press deadlines, there was just never time to get that response in the same day story. McCarthy was brilliant at knowing it, and by the time reporters started seeing a pattern of just how irresponsible he was and just how they were being manipulated, it was too late. He was off and becoming the most quoted American over those four years with the slight and only occasional exception 
of Presidents Truman and Eisenhower. Joe McCarthy was on page one just about every day. And he was on page one every day because he made great copy. What better copy could you dream of in the world than at a moment when Americans were petrified about Russia suddenly having a bomb? And they were students in classrooms across America were being taught this brilliant technique called duck and cover that when the Soviets sent nuclear weapons our way, all we had to do was duck under our desks and put our hands over our head and we would be okay. That was how scared we were. Joe McCarthy knew how to play into that fear and even better than the House on American Activities Committee, which came before him, he knew just how to manipulate the media, the, uh, his fellow senators, and ultimately the American public in a way that made him the longest lasting demagogue before him and the longest lasting demagogue until somebody more recently lasted four years themselves. Right, and they're not going away. And they haven't um, yet. And I mean, what, what you're talking about is, um, is so fascinating because we did not learn the lesson from Joe McCarthy. You know, we'll talk about what it was that brought McCarthy down in the end. But here was a phenomenon that lasted for four years. And he's the only politician that I can think of that has this horrible phenomenon of reckless charges that are baseless, mostly, uh, that he wields, who, who has that phenomenon named after him. Uh, we probably use the term McCarthyism too loosely these days. But it's, uh, it is a phenomenon uh, about recklessness. Um, but there were a lot of people in the American government in the early 1950s who weren't reckless. Uh, if you can think of a more sober president than Eisenhower, um, I'm willing to hear about him. But where was Eisenhower? Why, why did, oh, Joe McCarthy was a Republican, of course. Why, although he had begun life as a Democrat, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, why did Eisenhower, who must have been mortified by this bully uh, stomping around the country, why didn't he intervene and say, this is not what we stand for? So the only thing I want to take exception to in your wonderful, I want to just actually hear you talk about uh -huh. McCarthy because, but the only thing I would take exception to is um, the notion that he was the most sober president of his time or of any time, because I think one of the few presidents who was equally sober was Harry Truman. Mm -hmm. And Harry Truman tried to stand up to Joe McCarthy and he got steamrolled. And Eisenhower looked at that lesson and Eisenhower told his staff, his staff, and more importantly, the brother who he cherished more than anybody in his life, who was a very sober-minded president um, of, was it Columbia? No, Columbia is where Ike was. Um, his president, his brother Milton Eisenhower, from the beginning of Dwight's presidency, was whispering in his ear, saying, You are not just a strong ex general and a hero in America, but you won by a landslide and give up a couple points of your popularity to take on that demagogue, Joe McCarthy. And what Dwight said back to Milton was, uh, no, I'm going to wait. The only way to take on McCarthy is when McCarthy does himself in. And we're not going to give up our narrow majority, our narrow Republican majority in the Senate by taking on this demagogue. We are going to do what I did as commander in chief. We're going to let the enemy as much as possible do themselves in. And that may have been a strategically wise decision that people at the war college could look at and say, this is how a good general does things. But lots of people in the interim lost their careers, lost their families, and too many actually lost their lives. There were suicides all across America of people who were disgraced by Joe McCarthy. And all of these people looked to Harry Truman to do it, and Truman wasn't strong enough. And they looked to Dwight Eisenhower to do it. And Dwight Eisenhower, and this is a terrible thing to say about a war hero president, but he lacked the courage to take on Joe McCarthy 
at an early stage of his presidency. So there's not a big lesson in there for us in the present day, is there? Um, <laughs> So maybe the war college might think that's a great strategy for a general, but politically it wasn't such a great strategy. Yes, McCarthy eventually did uh, implode, but we know from more recent history that if you let a demagogue take control of the narrative of what the story is recklessly, dishonestly, uh, that there's a susceptible public uh, they may not be disabused in four mere years uh, of that narrative. Uh, that you need to, the political courage really is about confronting evil when you see it. We didn't do it with McCarthy. And I would say right now the Republican party is uh, evidence that we're, that we didn't learn the lessons that we should have from Joe McCarthy. So we didn't. And the, we also didn't learn the lessons, um, I think, in American history, um, there is nobody, as you were suggesting, that understood McCarthy's playbook more instinctively than Donald Trump did. And that was no accident. It was because the Joe McCarthy's protege was a brilliant, arrogant, um, one could say despicable young lawyer from New York named Roy Cohn. And half a century after Roy Cohn learned at the feet of Joe McCarthy, Roy Cohn was summoned by Donald Trump's father, Fred Trump, to teach a young Donald Trump how to deal with this cutthroat world of New York real estate. And the lessons of Joe McCarthy were passed on in the flesh by Roy Cohn to Donald Trump, and he learned every one of them. And at a certain point, he didn't have to learn anymore from Roy Cohn because it just came so naturally to Donald Trump. But I want to read you, you don't have to trust me, and I'm a journalist, so you should probably never trust me, but I want to read you two quotes. Um, one was a quote that may have been the most famous quote of all of the famous Donald Trump quotes from his 2016 campaign for president. And maybe listeners tonight will remember when Donald Trump boasted to supporters, he said, I could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and I wouldn't lose any voters. Well, exactly 62 years before that, polling pioneer George Gallup penned a chillingly similar prediction about Joe McCarthy and McCarthy supporters. Gallup said, even if it were known that McCarthy had killed five innocent children, they probably still would go along with him. And there was, my book is not called Joe McCarthy, it's called Demagogue for a reason, that I think what was scary about Joe McCarthy was not just McCarthy himself and this movement that 50 years later still sends chills down some of our spine, this movement called McCarthyism, it was that McCarthy was the embodiment of demagogues who came before him in American history, and that McCarthy, McCarthy was the archetype for all the demagogues that came after, be they named um, David Duke or George Wallace or Donald Trump. But Eileen, as we sit here tonight, um, if we read today's newspapers, if we listen to tonight's news, we see that McCarthy is also arguably the archetype for demagogues across the world, including in Russia today. And it's sort of ironic given McCarthy's anti-communist credentials that a guy named Putin in Russia today is following to the T the McCarthy playbook in a very different country in a different part of the world. Well, that playbook, as you say, is produced by Roy Cohn. And that playbook is attack, attack, attack never concede, never admit anything, any wrongdoing or any mistakes, just push forward. So when you were talking about how newspapers uh, covered McCarthy, yes, there was that pattern that he would release the information so late journalists couldn't fact check it. But when they did fact check it, by then he was on to attacking someone else. So the news cycle couldn't keep up with him. And if Donald Trump didn't replicate that, <laughs> no one did. And you see the Putin example is classic. Uh, 
what have we heard for the last few days that um, Putin is about to invade, he's about to invade, he's about to invade uh, the Ukraine. So he turns the story where he's not, he's sending peacekeepers in to break away sections of the Ukraine uh, that support uh, Russia. He's just turning the story in just such a way that, that the Biden administration is sitting there now saying, wait a minute, what can we call an invasion and what can't we call an invasion? And it's that incredible capacity that I think Roy Cohn is the architect of to define what's happening, even if your eyes tell you something else. So that's absolutely true. And I wanna just mention two other aspects of that playbook that Donald Trump borrowed and that Putin is borrowing as we speak. One is don't ever bother to tell a little lie that tell a big whopper if you're gonna do it and that a big whopper you pay no bigger price for and that people by the time they understand that it's a whopper, you're off to a new lie. Um, the other is the notion of scapegoating and scapegoating in Joe McCarthy's case meant blaming communists or sympathizers of communists or anybody who looked a little bit pink, blaming them for everything. Donald Trump blamed the rapacious immigrants who were pouring across our southern border for everything that was going on in America. And the Vladimir Putin, in a way that puts both of the others to sort of shame, his blaming Ukrainians and their Western uh, enablers for everything that's going wrong in the world, in the Russian world. And it is, it is working, at least for now, in the only audience that he cares about, which is the audience in his country. And he's giving Russians who have a lot to, uh, in a cold winter and at a time when their economy is not looking great, he's finding convenient lies and scapegoats to deflect the blame and every day the narrative changes and the only thing that is consistent is that he remains on page one of every newspaper across the world which is where donald trump wanted to be and where joe mccarthy wants to be and where every demagogue likes to find themselves and there isn't there also a piece of political genius in knowing that it won't just be your rabid supporters who are going to be receptive to this message. I mean, the whole country was in an anti-communist fervor after uh, World War II. Uh, that's where the threat was uh, to the United States. And he didn't just have supporters, McCarthy, among the Republicans. He had some pretty prominent Democratic supporters whose names will be familiar to our audience. Um, Joe Kennedy contributed to Joe McCarthy's campaigns. Bobby Kennedy, as you know, as the biographer of Bobby Kennedy, worked for Joe McCarthy's committee. Um, talk a little, if you can, about the Kennedy connection here. Oh, I do. Before I get to the Kennedy connection, I want to mention one other Democratic name where, where public libraries are supposed to be nonpartisan. So it's time after having bashed a bunch of Republicans for me to bash a few Democrats, including ones not named Kennedy. Um, and there was a minority leader in the US Senate who was dreaming of being the majority leader at the time that Eisenhower was president. And that was a guy named Lyndon Baines Johnson. And Johnson everybody who went to him and said, you've got to take on this demagogue in our midst, Joe McCarthy, he perpetually told them the same thing that Senator Taft, the majority leader was saying, which is, we're going to wait for the other side to do it first. He's a Republican problem. We're going to settle them with him. We're not going to worry about um, compromising our chance to someday be in the majority by taking him on head first. So smart politics, terrible on the front of courage and doing the right thing. But let's go to the Kennedys. And Joe Kennedy um, loved Joe McCarthy because they were two equally brash, sort of up from the bootstraps, um, Irish Catholic Americans um, who loved every time Joe McCarthy would come through Palm Beach, um, Joe Kennedy would invite him for a drink. Joe Kennedy was not 
disappointed that two of his daughters were people that McCarthy either dated or tried to date, depending on which version of the story you believe. Um, and then there was young Bobby Kennedy, who at the moment that he graduated from law school at the University of Virginia and was looking for a job, Joe Kennedy got on the phone and called Joe McCarthy and said, hire my son. And Joe McCarthy did. And Bobby Kennedy didn't just go to work for Joe McCarthy. He believed in Joe McCarthy. Bobby Kennedy started out his life as a very conservative guy, as an anti-communist in the mold of his father and even more so. And he believed in Joe McCarthy. He said that McCarthy is the one guy in Washington with the courage to say what has to be said about the communist threat in America. And I will say that the reason I wrote the book on Joe McCarthy was partly because I couldn't get out of my head something that Ethel Kennedy, Bobby's widow, said when I interviewed her. And she said, Joe McCarthy might have been a monster to much of America, but to Bobby and me, he was just plain good fun. Now, there are a lot of adjectives I've heard associated with Joe McCarthy. Good fun are ones that I was hearing for the first time. And I thought partly there must be more to this story than I know of the story of Joe McCarthy. And partly I thought there's this extraordinary confluence between Kennedy and McCarthy, our iconic liberal and our iconic conservative, and something interesting is going on there. And I want to just say one last thing on the Kennedys, which is there is nobody that I know in America who knows more about the Kennedy story than Eileen McNamara, who wrote a brilliant biography of Eunice. So whether or not you ever buy my book, go out and buy her book um, on Eunice Kennedy, and she makes an incredibly compelling case that the most heroic of that generation of Kennedys was not Ted the senator, was not Bobby the almost president, and it was not Jack the president, it was Eunice who gave birth to the entire movement on disabilities in America and who was the true courageous figure in that family. She was indeed, but she was, I'm not hawking my book tonight, but she was also, uh, as Ethel said, of somebody who liked a lot of good fun. And the one Joe McCarthy story I have from my Eunice research is on Eunice's birthday one summer, which is on July 10th, uh, the crowd was at Hyannis Port and Joe McCarthy was visiting and uh, they took him out on the boat and everybody was water skiing and they put Joe McCarthy on water skis, uh, which he promptly fell off of. And what they didn't know was that he couldn't swim. And I uh, had grown up in Wisconsin with all these beautiful lakes, but he was not a swimmer. And there's a wonderful scene that Ethel also described to me of Eunice when he was trying to clamor aboard the boat, uh, pushing him down repeatedly under the water. So uh, I suppose that's kind of the gauntlet you ran when you hung out with the Kennedys at a birthday party. It was, but can you imagine had they not rescued him how American history might have been a bit different than it was. It perished the notion that McCarthy would have drowned, but the notion that um, so many near misses, including one with the adored Kennedy family. Um, and Eunice, by the way, wasn't the only one that Joe McCarthy tried to date. Younger sister, um, Jean Kennedy Smith, was somebody who told me, and I presume told Eileen, that she was shocked that that old guy, Joe McCarthy, wanted to take her out and she wasn't interested, but Joe McCarthy thought- I don't think thought Joe McCarthy Mary... was interested in any of those women either, but I think, I think he wired that... them around Washington because there was some political advantage to it. It was. He was also being accused, by the way, it wasn't just communists that Joe McCarthy scapegoated. There were two other groups that he did most notably. One was Jews and the other was gays. And his gay bashing and his Jew bashing would have been enough to put him in the history books if it weren't for his red bashing, sort of right. trumping, can we use a word, all of that. But the Yes, I think, that, I think we can. Well, can we talk a little bit more about uh, the Trump connection? We know that there's a direct line to McCarthy uh, through Roy Cohn. But one of the things I've always found interesting is that Joe McCarthy's demise 
came about because of a new technology, a new media, uh, television. Uh, the Army McCarthy hearings were the end of Joe McCarthy in 1954. And television is what created Donald Trump. Hmm. How do we square those two things? So I want to take a little exception that it was TV that was Joe McCarthy's demise. I would say that he was already on a fade and TV struck the final blow. Um, I would say that his demise was when he took on an enemy too big to bully, and that was the army. And whether he had been taking them on and there had been no hearings, I still think that taking on the army guaranteed two things. One is that a lot of patriotic Americans who supported Joe McCarthy supported the US military even more. We had just fought an extraordinary war in, um, in Europe, we were involved in a war in the Korean War in Asia, and the idea that Joe McCarthy was saying that the army, it was one thing to take on these pinstriped Harvard and Yale guys at the State Department, it was another to take on our US military. And when he took on the army, it also made the one enemy who really counted come finally out of the closet and take on Joe McCarthy head on, and that was Dwight Eisenhower. And that was the moment that Eisenhower had been waiting for. He knew that McCarthy would overreach. McCarthy did overreach, went after the army, went after the army with incredibly thin evidence, went after especially the Jews at, um, in the army that he said were behind much of this conspiracy in the army. And that was when he did himself in. And the fact that he sweated the way he did and he looked as uncomfortable and as unseemly as he did under the glare of TV cameras was the final stroke. But had he been doing that and taking on the State Department, he was under the glare of TV cameras for years going after the State Department enemies. It was different when he took on the army. And I wanna say one last thing in terms of a Boston connection. He also took on maybe one of the wiliest lawyers in America, a, um, a leprechaun-like Irish lawyer from Boston named Joe Welch. And Joe Welch understood that McCarthy would eventually do himself in, and he gave him, to mix metaphors, he gave him the rope to hang himself. And I think that he did it brilliantly. And he did it not by going after him, but by letting McCarthy overreach the way he did, especially in what may have been the most famous lines ever uttered in a congressional hearing, which were going after this young associate of Joe Welch's, um, who he said must be a communist because he had joined a liberal group when he was in law school years before. And that was when Welch responded with what looked like a spontaneous line, but was in fact something he had in his back pocket waiting to pounce on McCarthy for, where he said, Senator, have you no shame? After all this time, have you no shame? And clearly McCarthy did have no shame. Welch, the only guy in America who didn't understand how McCarthy had hung himself at that moment was Joe McCarthy. And all across America, you could hear these outrage, you know, sense of echoing Welch, have you no shame, Senator? And I guess I, um, I, will, I will take being schooled by you that it was not, uh, television that brought down Joe McCarthy. But I do think those Army McCarthy hearings, had they not been televised, might not have had the impact you think they had. But nonetheless, and there was- Can, a I, can I just you support you for one second on that? He started the Army McCarthy hearings with, and I'm going to get my numbers wrong, but he started with something like 50% of Americans one in every two saying he was a great guy. And by the time he ended the hearings, his poll numbers had sunk to high 30s, I think it was. And that sinking poll numbers is what gave the US Senate the courage to finally stand up and censor their colleague. So you are right that it was the glare of the TV cameras that did him in, but I would suggest that he did himself in the moment that he decided to go after the army. And he well, only went after the army because he was protecting Roy Cohn's slimy friend, a guy named David Shine, who wanted to get out of serving in the army. And it was to protect an associate of his associate that he trumped up these charges against the US Army. And it was really kind of crazy. 
Well, since we have such a predominantly Massachusetts audience, we do have to point out who skipped the vote to censor Joe McCarthy in the United States Senate. Now, it is true that he was in the hospital after having just had back surgery, but we also know that he had the option to give somebody his proxy for his vote. And I'm talking, of course, about Massachusetts Senator John F. Kennedy. Yes. Uh, so if we're going to raise John Kennedy, we also have to say that it wasn't just that he did that, which was outrageous enough and which Eleanor Roosevelt rightly never forgave him for doing, but it was also that I think he did it as payback because Joe McCarthy, John Kennedy, as everybody will remember, when he first ran for Senate, was taking on a lion of the Republican Party and a lion of Massachusetts politics named Henry Cabot Lodge. It looked like Joe, uh, John Kennedy was going to lose. The one thing that I think could have guaranteed victory for Lodge was if fellow Republican Joe McCarthy had come into Massachusetts and had helped convince some of Jack Kennedy's Irish Catholic base that Lodge is an okay guy and it's okay for you to be voting for this Republican from Massachusetts. But Joe Kennedy asked Joe McCarthy to stay out of Massachusetts. He did, it was one of the few states that he didn't go in and campaign for a vulnerable fellow Republican. And I think that was the margin of victory. And I think Jack Kennedy never forgot what Joe McCarthy had done for him. Yeah. And I think that's why he didn't vote. He knew better than anybody why Joe McCarthy deserved to be censured. And yet he didn't pair his vote. He didn't give a proxy, he did nothing. He just stayed on his back and, uh, yeah. And ignore the vote. And, and he never when, said in later years how we would have voted. Right, right. And um, and Stevenson did a similar favor, as I recall, when he was running for president. Joe Kennedy asked him not to raise uh, Joe McCarthy uh, as an issue in Massachusetts because, frankly, Joe McCarthy had a lot of supporters among Irish Catholics uh, in the state. Um, well, tell us what we've learned, if not, or if we learn nothing. Um, again, it has I keep coming back to the media because I think it played a role in the rise of both demagogues, the more current demagogue uh, in our country, uh, former President Trump, and um, Joe McCarthy. The media now, though, is so fractured that um, if you had a television camera uh, facing somebody who was to make that wonderful speech that Joe Welch made about the lack of shame, it would have absolutely no political effect on the American people um, because apparently we're living in an age where nobody has any shame. Uh, and social media has changed everything so much. So there's a, as, are there a limit to the lessons we can learn from McCarthy? What can we take away from him? to help us navigate the new world that we're in. So I wanna argue counterintuitively that my book is a good news story. It may be about an evil demagogue named Joe McCarthy and all the demagogues who came before and after. And we know the bad news story and we know that we are still vulnerable, whether is it, it is in our White House or overseas in Russia, we are vulnerable to demagogues. Arguably the world has never had more demagogues in power at any time since World War II than we do today all across the world. My book is a good news story because I think the lesson of demagogues, at least when it comes to America, is that give any demagogue the rope and they will hang themselves. And Donald Trump was elected and that was the story that we're still vulnerable to them and yet he was a one term president. And that suggests that while we're late coming to realize the error of our ways and the demagoguery of people we bring into power, we do eventually recognize that and our better natures, at least for the first 200 and something years of our history is that we do eventually bring down the demagogues that we raised up to power. I love talking to you because you're such an optimist. I, on the other hand, am not so confident that you are, that you know that we're really through that period. I mean, it takes it at a certain point, the collective courage 
uh, of people to stand up and uh, fight for democracy. And I think we're in a moment where democracy is really imperiled because we don't distinguish now between what's true and what's a lie. And there really is a difference between the truth and a lie. Yes, but I think this is also one of the perils um, at times of uh, being, for instance, a Democrat in America. Democrats control the Senate, they control the House, and they control the White House. And yet most Democrats that I know or most liberals that I know are almost as distressed as they were when Donald Trump was in the White House and Republicans controlled both houses of Congress. Democracy is in peril. There are lots of laws being passed, all kinds of things. If we wanted to look at the threats to democracy, but what the press is doing every day and what is going on in terms of policies that are being made still give me reason for hope. And we're doing um, we cleaned house, and I think that the um, that that yes, the threats will always be there. But I think every once in a while, we have to um, have a little sense of hope and of optimism and recognize that you and I are hearing uh, here tonight talking about all these perils to democracy. And I presume most of our listeners are shaking their head and saying yes, because the press has pointed those out and because courageous politicians have stood up and said something bad is happening here. And I think even in this new law um, that's being debated and will probably be passed, um, which is not as courageous as the John Lewis Act, but this new bipartisan law to protect the American vote for president and ensure that it cannot be overturned as easily, um, it is not coincidental, I think, that the senator who is leading the charge from the Republican Party for that is a woman from Maine named Susan Collins, who chaired for years the same subcommittee in the Senate that Joe McCarthy chaired, whose idol in terms of her political idol was a woman named Margaret Chase Smith, who was one of the only senators who had the courage to stand up and do what she called her declaration of conscience, calling out Joe McCarthy. And there is a heritage of heroism as well as demagoguery in American politics. And we should celebrate that at the same time we point to the lessons of Joe McCarthy. And I wrote the book because I think those lessons matter, but I also think that, um, that we will triumph, hopefully repeatedly again, against Well, I celebrate your optimism, Larry, I do. Um, and I would just point out that Susan Collins voted with Donald Trump more than 90% of the time. So she's not exactly up there on the same pedestal as Margaret Chase Smith in my book. She isn't. But and when I interviewed Susan, Susan Collins for the book, I perpetually asked her, when are you going to do what Margaret Chase Smith did and issue your own declaration of conscience? And four years came and went, and she didn't do it. So she only learned partial lessons. And yet the couple key times when she did break with him were in issues like rescuing Obamacare, and they did matter. And I think she would say she cited with the demagogue more often than she would like to have, but when it came down to really important things, and who knows whether that's true or a, a rationalization. Gotcha. gotcha. Um, I'm gonna talk to our host here, who's host, hosting this webinar for us, to see if there are questions coming in, because I don't wanna leave the audience out of this conversation. Larry and I have both had the experience that the best conversation doesn't come from the two of us, but comes from you. So uh, are there questions out there, Robert, that we should be hearing? There are, Eileen. So thank you uh, for asking. And uh, I will uh, read uh, some of them now. And uh, uh, obviously, most of these are directed towards Larry. But Eileen, if you ever want to jump in, uh, feel free. Um, Terry asks, did Joe McCarthy ever admit he never had a list of communists? Or do we only know that from historians? Um, so Joe McCarthy never admitted any of that. And at the beginning, I would argue that Joe McCarthy started out as the ultimate cynic. He was looking for an issue that would stick anti-communism, 
was the issue that worked for him. He had tried a dozen other issues before that. And so he didn't believe anything he was saying when he held up that list in his hand or that non-list in his hand and said, I've got a list here. But by the end, he had drunk the Kool-Aid and he believed what he was saying. By the end, I'm convinced there were only two people in America who believed everything he was saying. And that was Mr. and Mrs. Joseph McCarthy. Um, so the answer is, no. Uh, Maureen asks, although McCarthy remained on friendly terms with Bobby Kennedy, did Bobby ever have an aha moment and realize that McCar what, what McCarthy really stood for? Uh, I'm sorry, did Bobby Kennedy ever have that aha moment? That's right. Right. So we've said that Joe McCarthy never had the aha moment of his own. And Bobby Kennedy, the closest he came to a, an aha moment was a famous quote where he described that Roy Cohn was taking McCarthy down a, an icy mountain in a toboggan and that it was, um, the ride was thrilling, but he basically said that McCarthy never put on the brakes, but it was all Roy Cohn's fault for pushing him down the hill. And I think that got it exactly backwards. It was Roy Cohn who worked for Joe McCarthy, not McCarthy working for Cohn. And I think that was Bobby's easy way out. He never wanted to acknowledge that this guy who he adored on a personal level and he knew was reckless on a political level, he, like his brother, never wanted to acknowledge that McCarthy was wrong and that he had been so wrong. So again, if I were capable of giving a short answer, I would simply say no. Could I jump in just to ask you to tell the story about Bobby Kennedy going to Joe McCarthy's uh, funeral? I mean, Joe McCarthy died tragically young and we know now because of Larry Ty's book that he did not die of hepatitis. He uh, died of the effects of alcoholism on his uh, liver. Um, which everybody suspected, but Larry got access to his medical records and, and made that pretty definitive in his book. But that's quite a scene that you paint of Bobby Kennedy going to Joe McCarthy's funeral. Yes, so Joe McCarthy is buried outside of um, Appleton or in Appleton, Wisconsin, um, where he lived for his adult life and John Kennedy says to Bobby Kennedy, you will not go to that funeral. And Bobby did what most of us do when our older brothers give us sage advice, we ignore it. And he got on a plane with a dozen Republican senators with a plane full of Republican congressmen. And after everybody else got off of that plane and all their limos took them off to the funeral, the, the plane landed in Green Bay, the funeral was not far away in Appleton, Wisconsin. And when everybody else had gone away and all the press had gone away, one slim, lonely figure walks off that plane and that was Robert F. Kennedy. And he gets off the plane, he bums a ride from the one reporter who was still around there, a guy from the Milwaukee Journal. And when he gets to the church where the funeral is held, all the dignitaries are down in the main pews. Bobby is up in the choir section, up in the, in the balcony where nobody could see him. When he gets to the graveside, all the dignitaries are gathered around the graveside and Bobby Kennedy is off in the distance where nobody can see him. When all the reporters start writing down all the dignitaries who were there, Bobby Kennedy goes up to them and begs them to leave his name out of the story, saying that it will get him in trouble with his big brother, Jack, who was planning, as he had been doing since he was probably um, came out of the womb, planning his campaign for the White House and knew it wouldn't help to have Bobby Kennedy show up at Joe McCarthy's funeral. And the reporters did what he asked, partly because he was a Kennedy and everybody did what a Kennedy asked back in those days. And so Bobby Kennedy's name never showed up as having been at that funeral. I was lucky enough when I was writing my book that that reporter who had given him a ride to the church 50 years later was feeling so guilty by leaving his name out of the story that he was willing to tell the whole story. And 
that was Bobby Kennedy partly protecting his brother Jack, but more importantly, remaining loyal to his pal, Joe McCarthy, but having it both ways, not letting the world know that he was still loyal to Joe McCarthy. So it was not Bobby Kennedy's moment of a profile in courage, but it was what Bobby Kennedy felt about Joe McCarthy. Fascinating. Uh, so folks, we'll take a few more questions from the audience. So this is the last call for questions. Uh, David writes, it seems clear to me that Trump has followed the McCarthy playbook. So why do you think the phrase Trumpism has yet to catch on? And all things considered, who played the game uh, the, the best, uh, Trump or McCarthy, in terms of getting people to blindly accept what they said? So that's tough to weigh. I, I would say they both played the game more effectively than we will ever want to look back and admit in later, later years. And the same way that most of America would agree today that McCarthyism is a bad thing and that we should be embarrassed by that era in our history. I can only hope that 50 years from now, 70 years from now, we look back and whether we call it Trumpism or not, we're equally embarrassed by how we bought into another demagogue who was as bold face, a big lie teller as Donald Trump was. Um, and I think that, um, if there weren't the term McCarthyism already out there, then I think we would be already penning the name Trumpism. But McCarthyism didn't really come into vogue until years after Joe McCarthy. And it may be that sometime in the not too distant future, we will be calling things Trumpism. Another follow-up question uh, from David. In your book, you often indicate how many people enjoy Joe's company, yet you otherwise paint him as so unlikable by means of his deeds. Did you fail to adequately show the side of him because of personal distaste for what he represented? Um, so I went out of my way and based in part on records that nobody had ever seen, his personal and professional records, to try to look for the good sides of Joe McCarthy. And I think I found some of them. And I, my first chapter led off with the fact that while most of the world thinks that tail gunner Joe McCarthy made up, embellished and made up most of his records in the um, uh, Marine Corps that earned him a dozen medals, I said, Shockingly, Joe McCarthy, in fact, was a war hero. And most of what he said he had, in fact, done, it was just that he was such a liar on so many other issues that we assumed that he was lying about that as well. And I said nicer things about McCarthy, I think, and maybe it's just me being defensive, but I think I said nicer things about Joe McCarthy than any other biography had ever said, because I had more records than any other biographer had ever had. And yet, in sum, 90% of his record was still nefarious and he was a bad guy. And to the 10%, does his war hero make up for all the damage that he did to our country? I think not. But to see him as this guy who could be a charming guy when he was in private, in a way that made him, to me, even more evil because he didn't believe most of the lies he was telling. And he was a great person to go out drinking with. And I believe that Ethel Kennedy was right, that he charmed you know, her eldest child, Kathleen, who was a toddler. Kathleen, while she would not admit it today and probably can't remember it, was in fact enamored with Joe McCarthy because he could be charming when he wanted to be. The sad thing is that what he chose to be was a bad guy most of the time. Uh, an anonymous attendee asks, if the media industry played a part in the rise of McCarthy, has it changed any of its practices since then? Yes and no. I think the media did a brilliant job in ultimately exposing Joe McCarthy. And by the way, it was not the reporter who gets the credit for bringing down Joe McCarthy. The reporter who gets the credit, played by George Clooney and everywhere else, is Edward R. Murrow, the famous radio and TV journalist. The journalist who did more to bring down Joe McCarthy than anybody else was the most popular newspaper columnist in America at that time, a guy named Drew Pearson, who went after McCarthy and for his efforts got beat up 
in a cloakroom of a fancy Washington club when John McCarthy ran into him and got ravaged in the, um, on the floor of the US Senate, but Pearson stuck with it and went after him. And I think the press ultimately with John McCarthy enabled him and brought him down. And the press enabled Donald Trump and I would argue brought him down. So is the press the good guy for bringing him down or is it the bad for enabling? And the answer is it's both. Most reporters, most of the time will go after a story that will put them on page one or make them the lead of the evening news. And that is what demagogues know how to exploit and they'll continue to do that. Well, uh, we're approaching seven o'clock and uh, Larry, uh, here's a quick question for you. How can people buy your book? Well, so I love that. I love that last question. And I wanna tell you how you can buy my book and how you can buy Eileen's book. And I'm gonna make you an offer that she may not be willing to um, the go along with, but you can buy our book anywhere at any bookstore. And we encourage you to go to an independent bookstore somewhere if you're gonna buy it. And the offer that I wanna make is that should you decide to buy my book or should you decide to buy Eileen's book, we will send you, we wish we were doing this event live and we would send you a book plate the same way we would sign your book if you were at an event live with us. And my email is simply my name, Larry, T-Y-E, Ty is one word, at gmail.com. Should you shoot me an email saying you bought my book somewhere, I will trust that you did that and I will mail you with my paying for the stamp in the envelope a book plate that you can put in that book. And if Eileen doesn't want to do that, I will sign her name on another book plate and mail that to you as well. And I want to just say one thing in closing. Clearly, I adore Eileen and I'm delighted that she gave up an evening in sunny, warm South Carolina to be with us tonight. But I also want to thank Robert, who kept his promise. I said I would love to do a book event if he would lasso a bunch of libraries to join in the event. He did it. You're here from lots of fun places. And I want to thank you for giving up an hour of your evening for Eileen and me. And Robert, thanks for putting it all together tonight. Uh, absolutely. My pleasure, Larry. Uh, my pleasure, Eileen. Uh, folks, uh, let Larry and Eileen know in the chat uh, if you enjoyed tonight's presentation. Eileen, we have 30 seconds. Did you have any last words? Well, it's always, it's wonderful to spend an evening uh, chatting with Larry. And for all of you who took the time to come, we do wish that we were there in person with you because we're actually much more animated when we're in person. <laughs> uh, uh, but thank you for caring about these issues. Uh, you can write these biographies uh, for the rest of your life and they don't mean anything if people don't read them. And they don't mean anything if libraries don't stock them. So we're so grateful both to libraries and to readers. Uh, we love you all. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, Eileen. Thank you to the 30 libraries who partnered with Tewksbury. And uh, folks, look for an email from me later tonight with the recording and a feedback survey. So thank you all and have a great night. Mm -hmm.